Welcome to Tuesday Newsday, your number one resource for the entire week's worth of VR news. Yeah, I know it's not a Tuesday, and yeah, it's been three months since my last video, but look, I made a promise that I'm only going to be uploading news videos when something big happens. And well, here we are. The biggest VR event of the year just took place, and there's a lot to talk about. More has happened in the past nine days than the past 90 in VR, and I'm happy to say that a new era has started. The Quest 2 is dead, and replacing it is Meta's newest headset, the Quest 3S. And we'll talk all about the details, but that's far from the only thing that happened. We got the first peek at the long-awaited Project Orion, HTC announced a brand new headset, and there's something else that hasn't been talked about much, but in my opinion is in some ways a bigger deal than all of these things. We got all that and so much more, but first, with all the research I do for these videos, I'm constantly in a web browser with like 200 tabs open at any given time. I guess you could say that browsers are kind of a big part of my life, and honestly, I could go for a shakeup. So when Opera GX reached out to sponsor a video, I thought, sure, why not give it a shot? Now, let's be real. Even the idea of switching browsers gives me a bit of a panic attack, but Opera GX has a quick import tool that makes it incredibly easy. A few clicks and all of my browsing data made the jump from Chrome, plus it's fully compatible with all of my existing Chrome extensions. But I was actually surprised by a new feature, GX Mods. I'm running the Cyberdeck mod right now, which gives me custom background music, keyboard sounds, and even shaders that change the look of everything that you can see. And uh, you can turn these off, of course, if you don't like it, or you could just go crazy with it. There's even a whole GX store where you can grab other mods like Dark Souls, Hades, or Halo, or just create your own. So yeah, Opera GX is a pretty nice changeup that's made typical browsing just a little more fun. And it's completely free if you want to try it out as well. Just hit the link down below and you too can shake up your browser experience. Thank you to Opera GX for making videos like this possible and supporting the channel. But now, back to the news. All right, so let's just get right into the exciting stuff. Meta just held Connect, their annual conference where they announce everything new that's coming from Meta, whether it's VR, AR, AI, all of it. And not gonna lie, this year was probably the best Connect that I've seen for the past five years at least. Every announcement was pretty huge and it wasn't overblown. Plus, Zuck looks a lot more human than usual. And you know what? I kind of dig it. At least it's better than the dystopian work in the Metaverse Connect that we got a few years ago. San Andreas. But on to the announcements because there's kind of a lot to get through. First off, let's talk about Meta's newest headset, the Quest 3S. Now, when I first talked about the 3S in early leaks about a year ago as a Quest 2 killer, I didn't think that it would happen this fast because along with this headset's launch, the Quest 2 and Quest Pro are officially dead. They are discontinued products. But I think that's a good thing, and we'll talk about that in a second. Let's talk about the new first. And ironically, there's not a single thing on this headset that is actually new. On board the 3S is a single 1832 by 1920 LCD panel paired with Fresnel lenses, the exact same display and lenses that are on the Quest 2, which also means that the three-stage IPD adjustment mechanism, field of view, sweet spot, clarity is also the exact same as the Quest 2. Meaning, if you put the headset on, it's going to look, well, the exact same as its predecessor. The biggest upgrades from the Quest 2 are all in the processor, battery, controllers, and of course the most obvious one from the design standpoint, the array of cameras on the front. Once again, here to remind you that this is the third iteration of Quest, which kind of makes me wonder what the fourth one is going to look like. While the optics and displays are the same as old, this new headset gets the Quest 3's ringless touch controllers as well as the same two RGB pass-through cameras that are found on the Quest 3. The only difference is that the Quest 3 has a depth sensor, which is not found on the 3S, and instead we'll be getting two infrared flood LEDs. The in-headset speakers are also the same that are found on the Quest 3, which is definitely a huge improvement over the 2s, but I think most importantly, the 3S is getting a processor upgrade, moving from the Snapdragon XR2 Gen 1 to the Gen 2, which is pretty much the biggest deal out of this entire headset. To be real, the Quest 2 and its Gen 1 processor has kind of been holding back standalone VR games, graphically at least, for a while now. The XR2 Gen 2 has an advertised 2.5 times GPU power, allows for more sensors, and apparently has 8 times 
improves the AI performance, which really comes into play when you're talking about hand tracking and controller tracking performance. The Quest 3 and 3S having significantly better hand tracking than its predecessor, while also, of course, allowing for things like ringless controllers. And something that I found interesting is that while the onboard battery of the 3S is smaller than the Quest 3, it's currently advertised that the 3S is going to have better battery life than both the 2 or 3, at least marginally, estimated at two and a half hours. Most likely, this is due to the removal of the depth sensor, which takes up a lot of battery, surprisingly. There is one weird thing, though. Meta decided to remove the headphone jack on the headset, which I'm kind of mixed about. The Quest 3's audio is pretty good, and the Quest 3S has the same drivers, so it's going to sound the same. But in terms of noise isolation, headphones are going to be way better than the built-in audio strap. And while before you were able to just plug in headphones, obviously there's no headphone jack, so you have to rely on, I guess, Bluetooth. But the onboard Bluetooth on Quest devices has always had a ton of latency, which is basically unusable. And so unless you use a dedicated Bluetooth dongle, it's just, like I said, unusable. So I don't know, this might be a deal breaker for some people, but for me, I guess I'll just stick with the head strap audio. I should also say that the 3S, at least the body of the headset, is technically 20% slimmer than a Quest 2 while being slightly fatter than the 3, but that obviously changes as you throw on the facial interface, so the size difference isn't too vast. Really, I gotta say, the biggest part of the Quest 3S is its price. The 128 gigabyte model is launching in the middle of October for $299 and $400 for the higher storage capacity model, and the 512 gigabyte Quest 3 for $500. I'm actually really excited about this. The Quest 2 was getting pretty old and also hard to recommend four years after its launch, and it was kind of holding back a lot of software, both because the processor and the black and white pass-through for mixed reality content. This headset solves both of those issues without getting any more expensive. And in 2024, when everything has gotten more expensive, and in a world where the PS5 Pro is $700, I gotta give a little slow clap to Meta for keeping the price down. Now, to be fair, it's flat out not as good of a headset as the Quest 3. The 3 has some of the best lenses out of any headset out there, continuous IPD adjustment, and I think it just looks nicer stylistically. But I'm also gonna be real, $500 is hard to justify, and it's also hard to recommend to people that, you know, are on a budget. And I think for just about anybody, the 3S is gonna be by far the best entry headset that we've ever had. I know that there's gonna be some people that are very angry about Fresnel lenses, but it works. Like, it, it's still VR. And I think the thing I'm most excited about for new people entering VR is that there's just so much content out there compared to whenever I first got into VR or even whenever the Quest 2 launched. For a new VR user, there's legitimately enough stuff on the Quest Store alone to keep people occupied for an entire year and still not play everything. I know people will debate quality, but in terms of quantity of content, it's not really a problem anymore. Now, of course, I still got to get it in hands to do a full review. I did order one, so I'll review it as soon as I get it in my hands. But all in all, I know it's not flashy or anything new for people that are already in VR or have a Quest 3, but it's going to be new to a lot of new people. And I think that's exactly what Meta was going for. But OK, so that may have seemed like the main topic, but personally, I think something else is way bigger that was announced at Connect this year. And it hasn't really been talked about that much because on the surface, it may not seem like a big deal. But over time, I personally think that this is going to be massive. So I know there's a portion of people that don't really care about pass through or mixed reality games like at all. And I don't blame you. There's a couple cool demos and maybe a few games that use mixed reality and do it well, but in general, mixed reality content kind of feels bad and it feels really limited. And that's because for this whole time, like since the beginning of pass-through on VR headsets, developers have never had access to cameras, like at all. And this isn't just for Meta, even on the Vision Pro, developers have no access to the cameras, at least for consumer applications. And I know that might sound a little crazy, how do you develop a mixed reality game? Uh, without cameras or without camera access, but that's just how it's been. In terms of camera access, it's literally just been a background, basically. And surprisingly, like this actually shocked a lot of people, Meta announced that they will be adding a pass-through camera API early next year. And I'm not joking when I say this, but in the past, I've equated this to being the atomic bomb of mixed reality. According to Meta, this will, quote, enable all kinds of cutting-edge MR experiences. You've got tracked objects, AI apps, fancy overlays, 
is seen, understanding, and so much more." End quote. And again, it might sound wild, but even from my own experience developing a few mixed reality apps over the past couple years, the only thing you could ever use was the environment mesh that the Quest 3 made, or the walls and tables and such that you manually set up. The actual cameras were just a background. So, if you thought that mixed reality kind of sucked or was a gimmick this whole time, you honestly haven't been wrong. Since the beginning, mixed reality has been extremely nerfed, but it's now actually opening up. Now, I'm not sure how much access developers are going to have at the end of the day. Of course, there has to be some pretty strict safeguards, which is exactly why it's taken this long for it to happen. Camera data is obviously extremely sensitive, so I'm sure it's not going to be uninhibited camera access, but this is still a gigantic leap forward, and we're going to see some pretty crazy stuff. I've always been curious to see who would fire the first nuke per se, Apple or Meta, and in this section of the mixed reality wars, this one goes to Meta. And I should also say that it is entirely up to developers to actually use and make cool stuff with camera access, but I can tell you already, even myself, day one that API is open, I'm going to be making something cool in Unity, so I think we're about to finally see the magic that mixed reality promises and is actually capable of. Now, of course, there was one other big thing besides AI that was talked about at Connect, and you know it, we gotta talk about Orion. Orion is without a doubt the most impressive AR glasses I have ever seen. And I know these may not look all that impressive, I mean, they're still very memeable and pretty chunky, only have a field of view of around 70 degrees, and are in no way a consumer-ready product, even though they were supposed to, something that we'll talk about in a second. But if you've been watching the augmented reality world at all for the past decade or so, you'll know that this is kind of huge, and some people are even saying that this is Meta's iPhone moment, and I don't mean that lightly. 70 degrees field of view may sound kind of small coming from the VR side of things, but that's actually industry leading when it comes to AR. And it's not easy to get there, and they didn't take a low quality way to get there. The displays aren't just screens or birdbath optics as are commonly seen in most currently available AR devices. Instead, Meta's using what's called diffractive waveguides. Essentially, a tiny projector whose light is diffracted through a ton of nano structures that are etched into the specifically silicon carbide lenses, eventually the light making its way into your eyes. It's incredibly cool technology that's powered by an outboard compute puck and controlled through a little wrist device that may look familiar. I've actually been talking about this thing for about five years now because back in 2019, Meta acquired Control Lab, a startup that was building a neural interface wristband, and that wristband has evolved into this, a small EMG band that is used to control the Orion. Using a mixture of micro and macro gestures, and at least eventually, you'll be able to control things with basically your thoughts. Supposedly, this wristband is going to be a product of its own before Orion's successor even comes to market. And speaking of Orion coming to market, turns out that Orion was actually supposed to be launched as a consumer device either this year or next. But late in its development, it was kind of shifted in scope, mostly because the software is a little lacking, but the other problem is a lot bigger. Flat out, manufacturing Orion just is not cheap. Like, it's a very expensive device to even build, which would mean that it's a very expensive device to buy. And it's like so expensive that the Vision Pro would look cheap compared to Orion. So instead of launching a half-baked device with no software support that costs an arm and a leg, they built about a thousand of them and are internally testing, prototyping, and building out software. Probably the best thing Meta could have done for the entire AR industry, to be honest. But of course, some things happened that were not Meta-related. HTC announced a new headset this past week, and it's actually pretty exciting, but it's also kind of confusing. This is the HTC Vive Focus Vision, which is in no way related to Apple's headset that happens to have a similar name. Instead, it's basically a refreshed Vive Focus 3, boasting some pretty impressive specs. Dual 2448 by 2448 resolution LCD panels, an advertised 120 degree field of view, stereo RGB pass-through, built-in eye tracking with an optional face tracker sold separately, and it has a display port out for wired uncompressed PC VR usage, all launching this year for $999, which actually isn't all too bad for the resolution and eye tracking and display port. I could see this being a pretty decent option, but there are a couple things that are really head scratching and kind of leave me wondering what could have been for the focus vision if just a couple little things were different. First off, the lenses here are pretty standard Fresnel lenses, which kind of sucks. The Quest 3S also has Fresnel lenses and they are a clear downgrade from Meta's newer pancake lenses in the Quest 3, but the Quest 3 is also a third of the cost at $300, so it's 
kind of forgivable. I guess another small negative is that it uses LCD panels and not OLED or micro OLED, but that's kind of understandable for the price. We are very much so still in the LCD era of VR. OLEDs and micro OLEDs are just really expensive panels. The real killer of this headset and what I just don't understand is that it still has the XR2 Gen 1 that the Quest 2 had rather than the Gen 2 that all the newest devices are packing. And it's kind of a shame. I feel like I could totally put up with LCD and Fresnel, but with both of those things plus an outdated processor, it really kind of limits how strong of a recommendation the focus vision could ever be. I suppose with eye tracking and display port out, it could be a good PC VR headset for something like VR chat, but even then, I feel like there are better existing options. Still, it's an interesting headset, that's for sure, and I feel like with HTC, it's always something that makes their headsets a hard sell. But I feel like they're at least going in the right direction. <laughs> it's better than the Cosmos. But now, it's time for question of the week, and I think I'm just gonna answer the biggest question that I've gotten the most times the past few months. Where the heck have you been, Thrill? And this video is already long, so I'm gonna make it short and sweet, but I've been cooking. I've been working on a few different projects, some of them VR software related, some of them video related, some of them VR software and video related. I've also been hanging out with family a lot more and running. I did a triathlon, that was cool. But in general, things have just been kind of slow. And I'm kind of grateful for it because I've been able to work on a bunch of other projects and kind of level up some skills. And I think that the biggest thing that happened the past three months was that PSVR 2's PC adapter finally released without most of the features like eye tracking, HDR, rumble, and adaptive triggers that make the headset compelling. So rather than squeeze out a news video with topics that even I don't find interesting or really worth 13 plus minute long video, I've just been focusing on making more videos like the VR UI UX philosophy deep dive that I uploaded the last time that I made a video. And while they take a lot longer to make and I gotta read books and research and animate things in Blender for them, I personally just find them way more satisfying to make. And I also have a feeling that putting out admittedly fewer but significantly higher quality videos is just better for the channel in general. And I just really don't want to make a video just for the sake of posting every week. I feel like that's not good anyone's time. I will say though, I am aiming to not take three months to upload. <laughs> But besides that, everything is good, and I think you're gonna like some of the stuff that I've been working on. Go ahead and leave a question of the quarter below. <laughs> I read every single comment, and rather than saying I might read it in the next Tuesday Newsday, since I don't know when that one's gonna be, I might just reply directly to them to keep the tradition going. I love hearing from you guys, and it's a way to connect with this community, and of course, every comment, including my own replies, do help this video. So it's all wins all around. And I also wanna say thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, especially my Omegas, for making content like this possible. And I've actually been adding little things here or there to my Patreon as perks, including a cool flippable Thrill Seeker challenge coin that you can add to your VR chat avatars. So if you wanna support the channel and all my future videos, the link is down below. And I hope you have an amazing weekend. Thanks for tuning in. And like always, don't forget to like this video if you loved it. Subscribe if you want more of this and hit that freaking bell if you just can't live without it. Much love, Thrill out.